INSEE is a proud member of the Siam City Cement Group Public Limited, a leading cement manufacturer in Southeast Asia. The Siam City Cement Group provides world-class construction materials to a host of countries around the world. This includes Cambodia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia and Sri Lanka. With a plethora of landmarks and buildings that define the skylines of these countries, the Siam Cement Group pledges to be a role model in corporate governance and sustainable development. INSEE Cement, Sri Lanka's premier cement manufacturer, is the brand behind our country's leading cement products and the driving force behind making Sri Lanka more sustainable. With a reputation built on outstanding performance in the quality of our products, unparalleled customer service, the dedication of our employees, our respect for the communities in which we operate and our ambition to set the standards for the industry of tomorrow. We have contributed to the growth of Sri Lanka with iconic developments across the island, just to name a few. The Lotus Tower, Altair Residencies, the Colombo South Harbour, Southern Expressway, Matala Airport, the Kalladi Bridge, the Kotalavala Defence University, Mahinda Rajapaksha International Cricket Stadium. INSI has cemented its position as the most preferred local manufacturer of cement in Sri Lanka. With its widespread distribution network comprised of over 7,000 dealers in retail segment located island-wide. Today, we have two plants in Puttalam and Gaul and two terminals in Gaul and Colombo. INSEE's Sunstar brand is Sri Lanka's first cement product to be awarded the Green Labeling Certification by the Green Building Council and was the first blended cement to launch in Sri Lanka. INSEE has a wide portfolio of cements and services to suit all your construction needs. The most popular among them, INSEE Sunstar, INSEE Mahavalli Marine Plus, INSEE Extra for mass pouring concrete, INSEE Rapid Flow Plus, INSEE Eco Cycle, INSEE Concrete, Convert by INSEE, State of the Art Innovation and Development Facility. Having been a part of Sri Lanka for almost a decade, we will continue to build on our long heritage of shared loyalty, creating trusting relationships with our business partners, people, and community, and delivering our promise of building the nation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to INSEE Eye to Eye, Innovation to Industry Knowledge Sharing Webinar Session. Let me, on, on behalf of the INSEE Management, INSEE Cement Management, let me, uh, let me welcome all of you to the 15th Webinar Knowledge Sharing Session. And this is the 30th Knowledge Sharing Session, which is organized and conducted by INSEE Eye to Eye, Innovation to Industry. I can remember once Dr. Abdul Kalam said, Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. We believe it. We trust it. That is why, as INC, as INC Cement, we ensure that we share our knowledge, not only the knowledge, but also the experience and our exposure with our fraternity. We believe that creates a typical win win situation to win this battle, especially in this challenging situation. We challenge the challenges. So, as a result, we organize webinar session to make sure that we do not stop our sharing of knowledge, experience and exposure with our fraternity all around the country and not only the country, our, with our overseas friends. So today's session will be on design and construction of deep basement structures, which will be conducted by our resource person today is our well-known engineer, engineer Nandana Surya, managing director, NCD Consultants Private Limited, and he is the president of Society of Structural Engineers, Sri Lanka. When we talk about today's topic, basement construction in Sri Lanka has become increasingly popular during the last few years in prominent commercial developments across urban areas of Sri Lanka. They are usually used for parking, supermarkets, storage, to house MEP equipment, water tanks, etc. Property prices and lack of space in urban areas, in addition to building height restrictions imposed by local authorities, have contributed to basement being looked upon as a favorable option. Many developers are now considering traditional semi-basement of 
uh, single basement options as building with deep basement structures become popular in Sri Lanka. The local experience in the design and construction of five level basements and the option of top down construction shall be shared in this presentation. So today's session, as I said, will be conducted by our well known engineer, engineer Nandana Besuria. So uh, to welcome our friends, our distinguished guests, and also the members of the fraternity, may I invite Mr. Jan Kunik. Jan Kunik is our Executive Vice President, Director, Marketing, Sales and Innovation of Incisimate. Jan, I think you are the best person to explain, welcome this uh, team, and also to explain the objectives of this session. Jan, over to you. Good evening, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, very warm welcome to all of you especially to engineer Nanana Visuria. Big thank you to joining today for this uh, very interesting session. Warm welcome to all of our engineers, influencers, consultants, technical officers, and uh, members of our construction fraternity in Sri Lanka. Uh, and a very warm welcome also to our uh, group chairman, of INSEE Cement, Mr. Paul Hugentobler, who's from Switzerland, where it's very cold. So he will give us some interesting thoughts uh, later today as well. Warm welcome and thank you for taking the time to join. It's our 30th session, um, the 15th webinar session. And uh, engineer Abisuria, you've been with us now, or you are with us today, actually the second time after having been uh, with us also with Professor Jaya Singer uh, two months ago on the session for optimized and sustainable super tall structures. So today actually we go into the opposite direction. We go underground, we go towards the basements and most Western or European countries having the basements is, is normal. Similar if we look eastwards, whether it is Bangkok, uh, Singapore and all the mega cities globally where we have more vertical structures and with that also the basement structures are getting more and more uh, important also from a structural perspective, whether it is for parking spaces, water tanks, uh, electrical space and then utility space. Uh, so we are really looking forward uh, coming from the up in the sky. Uh, tall structure presentation and your comments during the Q&A session towards the deep basement structures and uh, tapping on that uh, knowledge and then your experience there. Thank you very much for that, uh, Engineer Nanana Abisuria. Then uh, uh, two announcements uh, for the next two months. Uh, we will have one further session as always uh, on the last Thursday this month in November. Uh, the December session is usually in December with the hectic end of the year, we will not have. And in January 2022, as far as regulations permit, I hope we can uh, invite all of you back to the I2I sessions uh, live at our um, uh, hall in, in Periagoda so that we can also have our knowledge sharing and then also the informal networking session uh, live again. Um, with that, I'd like to um, conclude and let us have a very good and fruitful session today and handing over to our group chairman, Mr. Paul Huntobla to address the gathering for some words. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> and uh, I would like to welcome all the participants on this webinar. Um, must be a number of civil engineers here. And I must say the topic is actually very fascinating. I will come back to the topic a bit later. But first, let me tell you, I, I know Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan cement industry since the mid 80s, huh? when, uh, when the cement industry was all only Sri Lanka Cement Corporation and Mahaveli Cement. Huh? That was my beginning of uh, my kind of love affair with Sri Lanka. Uh, I have been there since mid eighties until today. And I must say when I saw the video before, I'm 
extremely proud of what this company is today. Huh? This company has had many ups and downs. Uh, let me also admit this over the last 20 years. And I see this company today as an organization has never been as strong as it is now, huh? never been as strong. And we have an extremely committed, strong management team. We have made huge progress in the last couple of years on the commercial side, on the technical side. And the competence level I can see today in INSI, INSI Lanka is the highest ever for sure. Huh? And I would like to thank everybody, Jan, Musa, to bring us to this stage. Huh? I'm sure we have, we have a solid foundation today and we will expand our business and we will work very hard to remain the leading cement and hopefully building materials provider on the island. Huh? That's very clear our strategy and our determination. We will invest not only in plant and equipment, but we will equally invest in the quality and the competence of our people for the benefit of all our customers. Huh? This leads me now to the second point. Contrary to what I think Sri Lanka had or what we were in the past, uh, we have moved much more into technical solutions because the country has made huge progress in infrastructure. As Jan was saying, the buildings went to the sky. Now they are going below the sky, huh? below the surface. I'm very convinced on this. Just last few days, I'm in Switzerland. It is reported that Switzerland has a tremendous shortage of land. Uh, land zoning is very restrictive. So even here, more has to go below ground, below level zero. All the parking, all the facilities, everything has to go underground. So when looking at the seams, which uh, eye to eye has been talking to you with experts in the last 20, 30 webinars, I'm convinced we are absolutely on the, on the, on the right track to make INSI a partner for engineers, for regulators, for authorities, for project developers, for investors, exactly because we invest and we build a network of technical competence huh? from engineering to materials to performance. Huh? And this, I must say, I'm very impressed and I'm very glad we have reached this stage. I'm actually convinced that we are just going to witness even another boom in construction activities, in infrastructure, residential, and this will be all over the world. We have COP26 in Glasgow as we speak, the whole <clears throat> dimension of sustainability, CO2, blended cements, you know, minimizing CO2 per cubic meter of concrete. All this is coming, huh? And all this needs, again, technical competence in materials, in science, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have we simply have to be at the forefront of this development. And again, we cannot do it alone. We have to build a network in every country we are operating and hopefully across the region one day. 
we have to build a network of experts, expertise, who is coming together, like in this webinar, on an informal or formal basis to share experience and, and leading practices. Huh? We all have the desire to win. I'm sure everybody on this webinar wants to win somewhere. Huh? And we have to win through technical competence. I really believe in this. Huh? I really believe in this. If we can achieve this kind of cooperation during the toughest times we have ever gone through, the COVID time, when we have to resort to Zoom and Microsoft and virtual meetings, I'm sure we will be able to do even better once we can meet again physically in the eye to eye and or whatever is on construction sites or engineering offices. I think we will we will do much better once, once it's safe again. It's not yet safe. So please make sure we stay safe and we keep on with these webinars and uh, move on from here once personal interactions are again possible. Huh? Uh, with this, I would like to close, I would like to thank you again, Jan and Musa and everybody who's contributing to running these webinars. This is an outstanding initiative, which actually has, has, has made it possible because of COVID. Otherwise we would never think of these modern technologies to be deployed to network a large group of interested parties and engineers. And why am I so interested? I'm also a civil engineer. I did study uh, uh, um, structural designs and uh, foundation. Huh? It is about 55 years ago, nearly. Huh? So, so I'm keenly interested to understand. I understand the basics and I'm happy to see that you guys carry forward to a much different level than what I have learned. So probably I cannot follow everything, but I know these are important pieces. And if we as cement and materials provider can be a partner in this, then I'm extremely happy, extremely proud of what uh, Sri Lanka and the people in Sri Lanka, uh, fascinating country. I love to go there and I've just waited. COVID is gone to come back and go to the mountains and to have some nice tea up there and let Jan and Musa deal with you guys. Huh? Thank you. So I'd like to close. I thank everybody again and also the speakers, the experts for sharing their knowledge for the benefit of the larger group uh, congregating here for this webinar. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Musa. Thanks everybody and uh, wish you uh, an interesting session today and many thank more to Paul. come. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, Thanks for joining. And uh, as you cannot join the full session later, as you know, you can look it up at YouTube. Yes. So then you get the upgrade from your 55 year old uh, civil engineering. Yeah. And uh, for sure it's free of charge. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, over to you, Dijan, um, for the introduction in detail of uh, Engineer Nandana Abhisuria. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Jan is our Executive Vice President, Director of Marketing, Sales and Innovation of INSI Cement. And also thank you very much, Paul, our Group Chairman in INSI Cement. I have the privilege and I'm honored to uh, have the opportunity to introduce uh, our resource person today, Engineer Nandana Besuria. Engineer Nandana Besuria graduated with a Bachelor of Science uh, in Engineering with second class honors specializing in civil engineering from the Faculty of Engineering at University of Peradeniya in 1987. He started his career as an instructor at the Faculty of Engineering and then joined Central Engineering Consultancy Bureau and worked at Samanala Weber Hydroelectric Project for four years. After working in both government and private sectors for more than a decade, Engineer Nandana established in CD Consultants Private Limited as a startup structural engineering consultancy practice in 1997. NCD is providing structural engineering consultancy services for large scale projects, including high rise buildings and buildings with deep basements. 
NCD has extended their services for over overseas projects, especially in India, Oman, and Maldives. Engineer Nandana read for his Master of Engineering degree at the University of Moratua, specializing in structural engineering design, which he completed in 2005. He obtained his chartered in, uh, engineer status from the Institute of Engineers, Sri Lanka in 1991, and is a certified structural engineer authorized to design building for more than 20 uh, uh, stories high rise. Engineer Nandana was uh, inducted as a fellow of the institution, Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka in 2009, followed by the International Professional Engineer status in 2010. Moreover, Engineer Nandana currently participates as an exam panel member for high-rise building category registration at IESL. Also, he contributes to the Construction Industry Development Authority, ZEDA, as a credential committee member. Engineer Nandana is representing the industry at Department Industry Consultative Boards for few universities, including Peradeni, Moratua, Jaffna, and Slate. Further, Engineer Nandana is the current president of the Society of Structural Engineers Sri Lanka and the first president of Peradeni Engineering Faculty Alumni Association, Colombo Chapter. May I invite Engineer Nandana Besuria to conduct and present the uh, presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dishan, for your kind introduction. And uh, very good evening to all of you. I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, let yes. me, uh, yeah, thank you. Let me share it. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, INC Cement Group for organizing this type of uh, knowledge sharing seminars. This is really useful for our young engineers uh, and also the uh, the technical officers and all those who are in the, in, involved in the construction industry. So, it is a, it's a really uh, very important uh, thing that uh, INC has started. I'm sure uh, most of our engineers will be benefited with this series of uh, discussions. These are not really the presentation, but uh, sort of discussions where you also have the chance to uh, share your knowledge at these uh, sessions. So without taking much time, I will move on to the uh, presentation. The topic is uh, deep basements. So I will uh, do, a, I think all of you know what basements are, but I'll do a small uh, introduction about basements. And then when you do basement, you have to do deep excavations and you can't do deep excavation without doing any earth retaining methods. So we'll have to talk about the earth retaining methods and also the structural engineering uh, part of these retaining systems. So when you talk about deep basements, uh, one of the important uh, system that we are talking is the diaphragm wall construction, which is very popular everywhere. And then the diaphragm wall construction itself cannot hold it. You have to brace it and you have to do some strutting methods. And then uh, the deep basement design and construction part in Sri Lanka also we will appreciate our knowledge and experience. And then finally the top-down constructions. So um, as all of you know, the multiple basement structures are becoming popular in, uh, it was popular all over, but it's becoming popular in Sri Lanka as well, because uh, for the simple reason, uh, we are working in an uh, urban environment. Um, uh, actually, the basements are nothing new. The history of basements are going for so many uh, centuries. And even Sri Lanka, in other areas also, we have heard about ba basement constructions, even tunneling. Even if you read the history, uh, even in uh, history books, it uh, talks about these basement constructions. Especially in the Ummaka Jataka, we all know uh, underground works are quite popular. But nowadays, it is challenging. Challenging because we have to do the basements in the, in the urban environment. So uh, let's discuss what those challenges as well. And also, if you see the other advantages, like uh, when you do high-risk constructions or any building, um, you have a plot coverage. You can't do more than 60 or 65% of the total area. But uh, according to our regulations, when you do basements, you can go right up to the boundary 
keeping only one meter from the boundary. So that one meter includes our support system as well. So especially when you talk about this uh, car parking, whether you have a, a large area or small area, the area required for the ramps, if you go for conventional ramp systems, the areas that you require for ramp system is same. So your system is not very efficient if you are going to park few cars. So, so in that sense, the car parks in the basements are very effic effic efficient as well. So with considering our uh, regulations and the cost factor, and also uh, car parking are not very uh, you know fancy structural or architectural parts. So you like to keep it under. Uh, because uh, when someone enter into a building, they like to see the uh, better view. So with the aesthetics also, car parking going down, we are, you know, using basement for car park is becoming uh, popular. So this is a couple of pictures showing uh, the basement. If you can see this uh, Sydney Opera House, the basement has gone to 37 meters. This was done in 1992. So uh, 37 meters. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka, we can't go up to that because we find our rock at uh, 20 to 25 meter level. But so our, our limit is not 37, but uh, around 25 meters. Okay, deep excavation and earth training methods. So when you talk about the uh, deep excavations, the selection of the appropriate earth support system is very important because uh, the safety is paramount important, uh, especially in the uh, basement construction in the urban areas. Uh, there are so many factors to be considered. So uh, selection of the appropriate earth supporting system to facilitate the excavation until the basement construction is completed and then the, the permanent structure is completed. Uh, it's very important. And also the water table. If you consider the Sri Lankan context, we find water table uh, sometimes from one meter to three meter level. So when you talk about deep excavation, we have to excavate uh, well below the water level. So controlling water table is also some important factor we have to consider because uh, as all of you know, uh, lowering the water table can cause uh, settlement of adjoining properties. So two important things that we have to consider when you do talk about deep excavation is the uh, earth retaining system, appropriate earth retaining system, as well as the method of controlling the water table. So let's see uh, what are the main uh, factors that we should consider when you talk about the deep basement construction. So now, when you take a decision of going for a basement, uh, these factors should be considered because uh, it is not like you get some drawings and then start designing. So your environment as a structural engineer, construction engineers get uh, involved from the inception of this uh, building design if you are talking about the basement construction. So one is the safety and stability. So when you talk about the safety and stability, it is the safety of your construction as well as the safety of adjoining properties. So uh, safety, the biggest factors that contribute for the safety of adjoining properties are the movement, the, the movement of the supporting system during the excavation process and also the water table. And then another factor we have to consider the excavation depth. So the, depending on the depth of excavation, your entire strategy will have to be changed. So you should know what the depth of excavation and accordingly you have to select the supporting system because as all of you know, when you go for deep excavation, your system will be expensive. So you should not select the most expensive system when you go for a uh, excavation, shallow excavation. So you have to select the right system when you go for, depending on the depth of excavation. And also working space is also very important because the working space during excavation especially with the starting system. Um, I think when you do uh, deep excavation, we have to laterally brace the system. Temporary system has to be laterally braced. So if you are bracing at a close interval, you find difficult to move your machineries, excavation machinery. So 
that directly affect for the speed of construction. So um, if you can provide bracings at a larger spacing with a special system, then your progress will be improved. You can increase your progress. So, so working space, all these factors to be considered together, not uh, in isolation. So starting method, that is lateral bracing system, the speed of construction and the accuracy. Accuracy is also very important. And also site limitations. So when you select uh, the system, the supporting system and excursion method, site limitations are to be considered. For example, if you go for diaphragm walls, let's say 30 meter deep, you have to fabricate your reinforcements and place it. So if you don't have space to handle your equipment, cranes and the reinforcement cage, so going for diaphragm wall system may not be practically possible. And also the materials. We have to use the best material. And again, the soil type. The soil type also contribute for the designing of uh, and selection of the systems. Uh, in Sri Lanka, of course, uh, we don't have a big issue. We have basically our soil is very good compared to the soil we find in other neighbor countries, especially in Singapore. Even in India, you find very soft soil, but uh, we are very lucky. Our soil is basically better than uh, most of those countries. And uh, the construction and exertion phases, water tightness, and finally the cost. So finally the cost will uh, take the will govern the decision as well. We have to give the cost effective and sustainable solutions as uh, the engineers. This is a simple uh, example illustrating on the earth supporting system. So when you talk about deep excavation and basement construction, uh, the temporary earth supporting system is very important. So you will see in this, uh, let me take the pointer. You can see if this uh, wall moves like this, and if this wall moves like this, this building will be in danger. So, uh, so struts, struts are important and we have to, uh, design accurately the sections of the struts to make sure that the earth pressure is taken by the struts. Now this, I think uh, all of you have heard about this uh, Nikoli Highway failure in Singapore. This, this, uh, uh, this helped us learn a lot of things about this underground excavation. Uh, because in Singapore, you get uh, mostly the marine clay and uh, certain factors were not seriously considered and this happened as a result of that. And after this incident, they did a lot of research and they introduced certain guidelines which we do follow for our constructions. Namdana, mm. question. Yeah. I can't hear you, Paul. When when was when was this accident in in Singapore happening? Uh, that happened about um, ten years back, I guess. Ten years back only. Yeah, that's a bad one, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to show you another one, but my video is not working. It seems. Is that this is a video I am trying to play? Um, what is it? Mr. Nandana, Mr. Nandana, try to exit from your uh, uh, go to normal mouse. Okay. Yes. Go to normal do. mouse and see if it works. Uh, how to do that? Back to exit. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still is a. 
Mm. How do you cancel the point option? Oops. <laughs> Automatic now. Can anyone? Uh, Press escape. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Press escape. Press escape in the keyboard. Ah, oh, okay, done. Ah, oh, thank you. So this is the uh, supporting system. Here also they have this blind So I am not uh, discouraging you to do deep excavation or uh, support decision, but you have to. I'm encouraging you to use proper methods. So uh, after this uh, Singapore incident, they introduced certain guidelines, I think, which we want to introduce in Sri Lanka as well. We have tried our best to include these uh, guidelines in our regulations, and actually it has been uh, already included in our regulations, in, 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 in our practices as well. The, one of the uh, re requirement is uh, the use of qualified persons. So QP is a qualified person. If you do excursion more than 1.5 meter deep, uh, you need a qualified person has to design and accredited to checker uh, is not required. Actually, if the qualified person design, that is fine. But if you do excavation more than four meter and less than six meter, in addition to the uh, design to be done by the qualified person, the accredited checker should do the checking. So it is like that. And especially if you are going for more than six meter, in addition to the structural qualified person, you have to get the service of a geotechnical Qualified person as well, and the actual checking by both structural and geotechnical engineers are required. So all these uh, systems are introduced to make sure that that type of incidents will not happen. And also uh, the the movement of the uh, temporary earth supporting system, temporary or permanent support systems are also limited to certain values. So this chart uh, will show you. Um, if you see the XOH ratio, X is the distance from the excavation phase to the nearest uh, uh, building or the nearest structure. H is the height of the depth of the excavation. So uh, if the XOH is less than one, that is like if the 45 degrees is less, then you are allowed only 0.5% deflection. So the wall deflection should be less than 0.5%. That is delta H should be 0.5%. And uh, if the distance is more, then you can relax little by relax and from 0.5 to 1%, you have a zone where you can relax. So when we design our structures, um, it is very important that we check the deformation, theoretical deformation. We will discuss later in detail the theoretical deformations in our design stage and make sure that your actual deformations are also well within the theoretical values. So you need monitoring. 
we will discuss more in our future slide. So, um, generally, uh, if you talk about the structural retaining systems, but we are fam familiar, most of our earth retaining systems are considered as permanent structures. But in the basement construction, the concrete retaining walls integrated to the basement structure is considered as a permanent structure. When you do the basement construction, you have the basement floors and concrete walls around. So those concrete walls are considered as permanent structures. And the term uh, temporary earth supporting system or temporary earth retaining structure is used for the system that we use temporarily until we complete our excavation. So until we complete the excavation, you need a temporary supporting system. That's why it calls temporary supporting system. But uh, in certain systems, this temporary structure become permanent or else with the other word, we can use a permanent uh, retainer system which can be integrated into the main structure. If I just, uh, just show a few slides. Now this is a very uh, conventional gravity retaining wall. This is, this is basically used to retain earth above ground and it is not a very cost effective but uh, commonly used in all over the world when there was no shortage of material we never thought of uh, optimizing these sections we use this and the concrete uh, cantilever walls are also commonly used uh, to retain earth and the gabion walls Gabion was also, also uh, uh, used for supporting earth and this is a flexible system where the soil is weak and, uh, and the drainage is superb in this system. So you don't get uh, water pressure built up. You can uh, simply design only for the earth pressure. So it is a very uh, option, good option as well. But when you go for uh, excavation, deep excavations, we had to use a completely different approach. So you know this uh, timber laggings and the soldier piles is quite popular in Sri Lanka as well as other countries because uh, the fixing of the steel soldier piles and timber lagging is very easy. But the, the drawbacks of the system is it is not a water right system. So if you have to do uh, a uh, couple of basements where water table is not a big issue or rather uh, they know water table or water table is not an issue we can go for these systems these are very cost effective systems and uh, a general uh, contractor can do this and also uh, we use uh, short grid walls certain places even on the embankments we use short grid uh, I think all of you know what shock grid is. You fix a mesh, even sometimes you fix, anchor the mesh to the rocks inside and tension it so that it will hold properly. And then you use the spray concrete to make the wall. But this uh, touch pile, tangent pile, or oh, oh, we commonly call micro piles, are also becoming very popular in Sri Lanka when you go for uh, middle level basements. So um, generally, uh, the piles, you cast piles to touch each other, but this is not a very uh, good water tight system. So we'll have to do a little grout pile behind that at each joint to seal water. And um, then you can use for certain uh, works. If you are not going for deep basements, um, you can use this micro piles as well. And then you know sheet piles. Sheet piles are also used for these are interlocking sheet piles. So if you drive it properly, the water night tightness can also be ensured. Um, and uh, the vibration is something that you have to consider when you drive and when you uh, remove the sheet piles. So if the space is available, you can drive. If you have a lot of uh, buildings close by, it is bit difficult to use these sheet piles. 
other system uh, which was quite popular in Sri Lanka for deep basements until uh, recently is the second pile walls. In the second pile wall, I think um, most of you have seen this construction. You do a wall out of piles. First you, uh, first you cast the primary piles without the reinforcement. Later you cast the uh, secondary pile with the reinforcement. So basically the reinforced pile is taking the lateral pressure. You don't design this primary pile to take the lateral pressure. So uh, the between two centers of this uh, primary pile, the entire lateral pressure is taken by the second pile. The advantage of the second pile is second pile, you can go up to rock, you can even go into the rock, and you can use second pile as part of your building uh, to take the loads from your building as well. It could be part of your structure. So second pile walls could be considered as a permanent structure, permanent retainable structure. But it is uh, time consuming. And also uh, because it is time consuming, uh, it is expensive as well. Then uh, we discuss about the diaphragm wall. Uh, when you compare uh, the second pile and diaphragm walls, so diaphragm walls are more uh, cost effective as well as it has a lot of other advantages. For example, the diaphragm wall, we will discuss in detail about the diaphragm wall, but at the introduction, the panel, uh, per day you can cast a panel uh, three to five meters long. And uh, therefore the construction is very fast. Since we, don't, we have less joints compared to second piles, we have less uh, water tightness problem. And also uh, the, the surface is flat, so you can construct your basement construction, const uh, retaining walls against this. When you go for second piles, you have to flatten this area. We can't construct uh, the, the permanent retaining wall of the basement against this because you have to flatten this. Then there will be some waterproofing involved. So after the waterproofing, only you have to do this. So there will be extra works involved when you go for second piles. But in diaphragm wall, uh, it is much better. So uh, that's why the diaphragm walls are becoming uh, very popular in the deep basement construction. So I thought uh, we'll discuss more about the diaphragm wall, which is more appropriate for the today's discussion. So diaphragm wall is a continuous concrete wall constructed on the perimeter of the basement structure, found on rock or very hard strata. Remember now uh, the, this. Diaphragm wall construction, we can go, we can do at the right at the boundary. And uh, we have, with our experience, we know within one meter spacing, we can construct it. So the regulations have given one meter, and we can very well utilize that one meter for the diaphragm wall constructions. And it is used as a permanent structural wall because when you uh, design this diaphragm wall, we design to take the lateral forces during excavation and after the permanent structure is done. So it is working as a lateral a permanent wall. So when you design your retaining wall inside the uh, diaphragm wall, you, you don't want to design that for the lateral forces. It could be just a skin wall as well. Uh, we, some project we are used as a skin wall only. So uh, that's why it is becoming popular. And uh, I will uh, discuss uh, the advantages of using diaphragm wall in the next slide. Uh, so when you use uh, diaphragm walls also, you need lateral supports. So lateral supports, there are few different ways of doing that. One is uh, lateral bracings uh, at certain levels the steel bracing system that is quite popular. And you can use concrete bracings also. We have used concrete bracings. That's also very uh, good system. But both these systems are providing inside our working space. So you have a uh, lot of construction difficulties. 
And if you use uh, soil anchoring, your space is free, you can freely do your construction. The construction is very fast. But soil anchoring, uh, you are going to somebody else's territory and uh, you have to get the permission. So uh, if you don't get the permission, you can't go for soil anchoring system. And also when you uh, do the anchoring, you have to lower the water table. So if there are structures, so there can be some effects. So uh, in Sri Lanka, the soil anchoring has used at a couple of places where we don't have uh, buildings around. And when you do construction in the urban areas, uh, the options would be basically the lateral bracing systems. And uh, the speed of construction is about three to five meter panel installed daily. The accuracy also with this uh, construction method, um, we can maintain the accuracy up to 2%. Because the operator can do it. Operator has, can monitor during the excavation uh, and we can correct it if, the, if it is going out of this uh, limit. And also, uh, now if you talk about the sizes, generally the uh, diaphragm wall sizes, the minimum sizes are about 600. In Sri Lanka, we have uh, only 600, but you get uh, 750, 900 other countries. But when you compare the a uh, second pile, the minimum diameter we use is about 830 millimeter. So the con uh, concrete consumption of for second piles is more than what you go for diaphragm walls. And it is suitable for stable soil types. And water tightness also good because you are getting joint only at about 3 to 5 meter gap. So in the diaphragm wall construction, the common uh, terms we use is a guide wall. Uh, first of all, we'll have to construct the guide wall to make sure that the diaphragm wall is going within the accurate guide. And then uh, uh, camp shell excavate is the one that we use to excavate. And when you, uh, when we are going to do the construction of the diaphragm wall panel, you need stop ends. So there are certain uh, uh, cutoff walls. So slurry walls, all those that we discuss when you talk about this diaphragm wall construction. This is, the, this is an illustration of the diaphragm wall construction. First of all, you excavate this, this is the camshell excavator. You can uh, excavate up to the hard strata. Basically, the soil having uh, SPT value 50, uh, you can excavate from, you get a grabber there. From that, you can excavate and take the materials up. So you can uh, repeat this excavation up to the length of the wall that you require. You can't extract the whole five meter panel in one operation. You have to extract like this. We will illustrate later. Then, then you have to uh, provide the bentonite slurry, whatever. And then you can uh, lower the reinforcement cage and then concrete it. Once that is done, uh, before that you have to fix the uh, stop ends as well. And then you can move to the next panel. Or else you can do construction somewhere else and then come back also. That is also possible. This is the uh, camp shell excavator that I explained. Uh, this is the grabber here. And a uh, few things that you should know when you do diaphragm wall is, uh, if you are going to do the diaphragm wall on a, on a slopey prop, this type of area will be left because you are, uh, the, the, the grabber in the camp shell cannot reach these corners because it it is sitting. So we'll get uh, spaces underneath where seepage can occur. But uh, you can minimize this by having smaller panels. Now, if this, if this panel is five meter or let's say six meter by making this panel length three meter, you can minimize this. Then it will come like this. It will come like this. But uh, 
there is a solution for this. In uh, we have seen in other countries, they have used uh, cutter cutter pumps. With a cutter pump, you can go, you can excavate into the rock. You can do something like this. So what is shown in the dotted line is the excavation level. If you are using cutter pump, then it is hundred percent uh, watertight, and it will act as a locker as well. Especially if you are doing your basement excavations, almost closer to the rock level, you have to lock the wall into the rock. So you have to socket it in the rock and you have to use cutter pumps. So far, I, we have not seen cutter pumps in Sri Lanka. So we work in, in this manner, but we have seen in countries like Singapore and other countries, they use cutter pumps. Okay. If you talk about the bracing and strutting methods, uh, generally uh, steel bracing is quite popular, but concrete uh, beam construction is also, we have used, we know it is a very good system. So uh, if somebody wants to go for concrete bracing system, you can go for that. It is cost effective as well, according to the contractors, but these are temporary. You want, when the construction is happening, you have to remove it. And uh, we as engineers, we have to plan uh, the entire uh, lateral basin system because it should not coincide with our beams and column positions. So when you use a uh, lateral basin system, you have to provide king post and it should not, king post should not coincide with our columns and your lateral basin system should not coincide with the beam arrangement of the permanent structure. I will uh, show a small uh, video showing how the uh, diaphragmal construction will be done. This is the earth profile. So you construct the guide walls. And then the exception will be done. So once it reached to the hard level, you go to the next level. So those are the stop ends. So once the concrete is hardened, you can remove the stop ends. So the, here you can see some uh, pictures showing the bracing systems. Remember when you do this lateral bracing system, as I said earlier, you have to avoid uh, columns and the beams, as well as you have to provide some working space. In the bracing system, you should provide some working space for you to take your machines down or up or to take the Excited materials up and also to the lower the construction materials. So this system, the advantage is these are pre-stress hydraulic struts. If you uh, feel that your walls are moving, you can correct it by jacking. But this is a bit of an expensive system. Or as you can go, as I explained, uh, soil anchoring system. You can see the soil anchoring a series of soil anchoring you do, then your space is free. Otherwise, you can go for concrete bracing system like this, but you can see <clears throat> even with the concrete bracing system, you can make some um, working space. Especially the concrete is a good material for compression. So using the compression principle into the consideration, you can make a, a rings here with the bigger openings. This is one of the uh, construction site where we have used steel bracing system. You can see here, we have kept one 
in the front and one in the rear to take the materials uh, excavation up. Let's discuss some construction works in, we have done in Sri Lanka. So this is one of the construction, five basement construction done at Darpal Mahotha for Silex Enclave Private Limited. This, uh, in this basement construction, we use steel bracings with the Vela beam there. And you can see the king post. King post start to be uh, founded on the piles again uh, in the grout piles, grouted uh, piles because this bracing system has certain weight. So the, uh, the steel bracing, the king post load should be transferred to the proper base. Otherwise, there could be some settlements of the bracing system because the bracing system is under compression. Buckling should be avoided. Any kind of buckling can cause uh, axial shortening will be happen will happen anyway. Uh, you have to consider those axial shortening in the design stage, but buckling should not happen. So in the previous uh, video that I showed you, the cause was buckling of the struts. So buckling is very serious. Now this is uh, another project that is the Odell Mall at Town Hall where uh, we have done five basements. There you can see uh, the king posts. These are king posts done out of steel plates. The, the load is huge. And uh, the bracing system is concrete bracing system. The advantage of the system is uh, you are the, the height between two bracing systems are much higher. And you get a big working space, basically uh, six meter between two uh, bracing system is used in this construction. And this is of course after completion of a couple of basements. So I would like to talk a little bit about uh, into the theories as well, because all of, most of you are engineers and I'm sure uh, the structural engineers are also there. So, and geotechnical engineers are so there. So basically, before you do the diaphragm wall designs, we have to uh, study the soil profile. So if you do boreholes, uh, let's say five balls or 10 balls, your properties will not be the same. The, they are, the layers may be different. So each and every borehole will have to check. We have to study the uh, soil profile. You can see here clay is and in this is quite uh, common in uh, in Colombo, you will find some organic clay as well, but then uh, weather rock and the sandy soil is quite uh, common in most of our areas. But you have to uh, check the depth of each layer and the soil type. And then uh, we have to find certain uh, properties, material properties. You can see, uh, the, of different soil types, we have to, we have to find the uh, <coughs> unsaturated unit weight, saturated unit weight, permeability in horizontal direction, permeability in the vertical direction. These are required in the Young's modulus, position ratio, positions, friction angle. So these properties will have to will have to advise the soil investigation party when you. instruct them to do a soil testing, that these properties are required. If you don't request, they don't do. So knowing that you are going for a deep basement, you have to prepare the specs, specification for soil investigation. And you have to advise the geotechnical engineer that we need the following properties. So these are the properties that you require for the diaphragmal design. Then, uh, then we have to consider the stage construction. The stage construction is uh, in the normal uh, bottom to top construction. The bracing system is done from top to bottom. So uh, you can do certain level of excavation without any lateral basing systems. Then you have to provide the, the lateral bracing system. And then you can do further excavation, then provide another bracing. So, so on, we can proceed it until you reach your 
excavation level. So this, uh, these construction stages should be considered in the analysis of the diaphragm wall. And also after completion, then you will construct your first, the last basement level, and then you can remove one, the bottom prop. And then you can construct your walls and maybe another level of uh, slab, and then you can remove the other prop. Like that, you can remove the props while you advance your basement floors up to ground level. So all these stages should be considered in the analysis and design the diaphragm wall for the worst case scenario. So this is uh, one of the structural software commonly used for diaphragm wall analysis, it's called Plexis. You can see this, uh, you have to model the diaphragm wall as well as the soil and also the, the each and every prop levels. Then uh, by doing, we are getting the uh, reactions. Now, if you go back this, so these props, let's say one, two, three, four, five props. For each and every stage, we check the uh, lateral load transfer to each props at each level, and then you have to plot it. So you can see now uh, the temperature at level one, at stage three, you will get some load. But stage two, you don't get level because you are still below. So when you reach this level, you will get process. And like that, you can see, if you take one level, the topmost level, the maximum pressure has occurred when you reach the stage 21. That is the bottom level. So when you are designing the lateral bracing system at this level, you should design for the highest load because at one stage, this system will, uh, will have to take care of this load. If you are designing the strut two, you have designed for the highest one. If I take this example, you can see, you don't want to design the same bracing system for strut two because the maximum load is different. In the strut one, the maximum is 66.72 in this particular example, but in the strut two, it is 140. So as you go down, the forces are increasing. So uh, to be to make your design posterity, you can design different sections for different levels. So level five is the uh, looks like the last one. So the other forces are very high. So if you design this one for the all the levels with the same system, it is not economical. So as structural engineer, we always try to give the most cost-effective designs. So you can design for different levels, for different values. And this is how you get the displacement, as I told you in my previous slides. We have to check the maximum deformation of the diaphragm board because we have already discussed about the limitations. So depending on the, the distance to the close by structures, we know X O H ratio, and it could vary from 0.5 to 1%. And we know that by value, this is the maximum we can allow. We know if, you, if that is exceeded, there could be a danger to the adjoining properties. So we, in the analysis, we check what the deformation. This is the most important one. Your diaphragm wall system, if the deformation is exceeding, you have to go back and then provide, you have to alter your supporting system. Or else you have to increase the thickness of the diaphragm wall. When this is satisfied, then you can move to the other elements like bending moment, shear force, axial forces, and you have to design the diaphragm board to satisfy these bending moments and also the shear forces. So in the diaphragm wall design, uh, we basically, I think all of you know uh, how to design for bending moments. Uh, so the diaphragm wall has uh, two phases of reinforcement, vertical and horizontal reinforcement. The uh, vertical reinforcements are taking care of the bending moment in that direction. Horizontal one also taking the uh, also taking bending moments because the lateral basins are provided at certain intervals. In between, you have it is like a continuous panel, and uh, the the link should be provided 
to take care of the shear force. And uh, as I said, uh, the diaphragm wall is designed as a permanent structure. So we have to design for uh, thermal and uh, thermal crack and shrinkage. So crack width should be maintained. Generally, we know the 0.2 millimeter crack width has to be maintained on external surfaces. So in your design, you have to check what the crack width and make sure that it is less than 0.2 millimeter. And this is the, the detail of a guide wall I mentioned earlier. And uh, this is a typical reinforcement detail of a diaphragm wall panel. You can see now, uh, this is the stop end. So step end, the reinforcement does not go through the stop end because we complete one panel and then move into the other panel. So there is no practical possibility to extend the reinforcement. So you have to, you will have a joint. There will be a permanent joint. Therefore, we have to provide a water bar. PVC water bar there. So uh, let's discuss how you do this, provide this practically in the real construction. Uh, this is what you have drawn. You have reinforcement, you have the links there, the vertical reinforcement, vertical reinforcement are there, and then you have a stop pen and a water bar. Let's see how we provide it. So now this is the stop pen and this is the water bar. So when you, uh, as I said earlier, once the excavation is done for one panel, you have to provide uh, stop pen on, I, if, is, if that is the first panel, you have to provide stop pen on both the faces. So when you provide stop pens, this water bar is inserted into the stop pen. You can see, if you see this, now this is the metal uh, stop end, and this is the water bar, PVC water bar. 50% half of the water bar is inserted into the panel. And when you place it, when you place it, half goes into the panel. And once, once it is concrete, when you remove the panel, this will be left. You can carefully remove the panel, leaving the water bar in half into the concrete. But remember, we don't immediately remove this. We will remove this once the next panel is excavated. Because during the excavation of the next panel, this water bar can get damaged. So you don't remove this. The stop pen until you complete your next panel. Once the next panel is completed, only you will remove the stop pen. This is another illustration of this is how it is inserted. So um, this part will go into the concrete. This will be left in the stop pen. This is how you do. Uh, the construction of guide wall at sites with the in situ concrete. And this is, you can do the same guide wall construction with precast panels. You lower the precast, this precast panel can be reused also. That is one advantage. The construction is very fast. This is, I have taken this, I actually one of my resident engineers in these pictures today afternoon from one of the sites today. So um, these panels can be reused. That is one of the advantages. And you can see uh, the reinforcement cages fabricated to lower for one panel. So the space should be available. This is the, the Odell Mall. You can see this. Uh, you, I hope you can imagine the size of this panel. So if you don't have the working space, then of course, uh, going for the diaphragm wall option is difficult.
you see this, uh, the camshell is moving right up to the boundary. So while you are having some buildings, you can still do the diaphragm wall construction within the one meter. And uh, it is very important that we monitor all of excavation works during the construction of diaphragm wall, excavation and completion of the basement. This is to ensure the safety of our construction as well as the uh, safety of the adjoining properties. So uh, some of the standards methods that we have to and we should use are the inclinometer readings. This inclinometer can check the verticality of the diaphragm walls. And then you have axial load sensors, that is to check the axial load whether it is varying, and then survey points on the diaphragm wall. So the survey points of the diaphragm wall also can check the whether there are a movement. This, this monitoring has to be done regularly, especially at uh, different excavation stages. Because at uh, different excavation stage, as I showed in the uh, analytical model, you can see you have different uh, values. So we'll have to monitor and we have to make sure that the actual uh, movements are within the theoretical values. So if your design is accurate, it should be within the values. So lateral displacement of <coughs> soil, <coughs> sorry, surface subject and outside, and the groundwater table. So groundwater table also inside and outside should be monitored because certain amount of dewatering has to be has to be done during the excavation. But when you do <coughs> diaphragm wall construction, the dewatering is not very critical. Excuse me. So this is how you monitor. These are the monitoring points from this diagram you can see. We do the inclinometer readings and then the uh, survey points and then the groundwater table inside and outside. Because inside also we don't lower too much. We just lower one meter below our excavation level. But outside the water table has to be consistent. It has to be maintained. So this is a recording of the inclinometer. At the bottom point, it is zero because the bottom will not move. But uh, you can see certain places. This is, if you can remember this with the deformation diagram, what we showed in the previous slides, you can see some, some uh, compatibility is there. Yeah, so concrete lateral basins. This is how you do the lateral bracings with concrete. We do the reinforcement just like you do ground beams. You excavate trenches, place the reinforcement, fix the form where concrete it. So once the concrete is done, you can excavate. So you don't want uh, serious uh, form work because you can simply do it. And this is uh, some of the pictures showing the exposed diaphragm wall. The, the black color is because uh, it is ready for fixing the membrane, waterproofing membrane. The waterproof membrane, there are two types. One is the uh, atactic polypropylene membrane, other one is uh, bentonite, uh, bentonite membranes, those. So you are now coming, you go up to fifth basement level, then you construct flow by flow and then coming up to ground level. The one of the important thing that you can see is this concrete ramp. This concrete ramp was constructed purely to take your excavated materials up. So this has uh, expedited the entire excavation process because you simply take your trucks up to the excavation level, take the mark up, which is very much faster than taking from the the conventional system. You can see some of the bracing systems, concrete bracings, and this is the king post, and these are the concrete beams. So when you come up to this level, you have to cut and remove this concrete. 
okay so we talk about this uh, <coughs> standard uh, basement construction that is we construct diaphragm walls or any other system you provide lateral basins you excavate as you go as you advance your excavation you provide more and more basins then you go to the bottom level of the excavation construct the raft the first raft then you take your walls up then you construct the other next level and if the basins are there you can remove one by one then you come up to ground level so until the basement construction is completed you can't do any superstructure so obviously the construction period is much higher when you follow the conventional system but the top down construction is different different in the sense uh, while you do your basement construction you can take the do the superstructure as well and uh, it is not only the time saving but there are many more advantages this is how you do it uh, in a brief so uh, the king posts we used in the previous exercise are going to be the permanent columns of the main structure but suppose your structure is a concrete structure you have to use steel sections up to the ground level temporarily right these steel columns are used temporarily until you complete your basement structure so you do the piles and you insert your steel columns into the pile we'll be working from the top to ground level so you insert your steel columns into the piles <clears throat> suppose you are planning to let's for example suppose your building has four basements and uh, 25 floors but you are planning to complete uh, 10 floors by the time you complete your basement so these columns are designed these columns are designed to take only the weight of 10 floors and the weight of four floors later when when you as and when you complete your structure you go for a composite concrete you 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 can concrete around the steel column and make a composite column which is designed to take the total load of the building so that way you can uh, economize your design so uh, the pile foundation and steel columns installation is done as the first step as i explained then you cast the ground slab you don't do any you don't want any uh, lateral systems because your permanent slab can be cast at the ground level because your columns are there on top of the column you can even use steel beams or concrete beams and you can construct the ground slab once the ground slab is done you have a very strong lateral basis system then you can go to the next level so when you go to the next level again you can cast the next slab and so on you can advance your excavation while you are completing the basement construction and remember once the ground slab is done you can go up also so the, the superstructure can go parallelly and uh, you need certain uh, working space so if the uh, at the time of designing the building if you can provide some uh, openings which could be uh, a permanent opening because having some openings are very good for basement structures to get uh, light and ventilation so if you decide, if you can incorporate openings in the basement in, in the basement floors that could be used to take your construction materials up so it should be integrated in the design as well so this this picture also shows you now you can see the if you carefully see you can see steel column inside and wrap with the reinforcement bars around it and then you go for the per normal concrete construction so below that you can see it is steel beams and a concrete normal floor so as i explained the excavation under the ground floor slab should be done up to the next basement level and the same could be done on the steel columns so uh, you excavate it and then you can go and with the advantage of the system is uh, you don't want to spend extra money for temporary uh, lateral bracing system of course your uh, diaphragm wall or the any other uh, 
supporting system has to be there, but you can save money from the lateral basin systems, temporary lateral basin system, and obviously the concrete flows are more stronger, and it uh, the performance are much better than the standard lateral basin systems. You can see later the the RC columns are wrapped with the standard uh, reinforcement of the concrete to enhance the capacity of the final structure. And all those star wells and things can be constructed later. Those uh, wells can be used to take your construction material stuff. So uh, advantages of using top-down constructions are the work progress could be increased since the superstructure could be constructed simultaneously. No extra lateral bracings are required since permanent basement slabs shall provide the required lateral support. The ground improvement is minimum. Ground movement is minimum as the permanent flow slabs are more strong with the solid slabs and beam arrangements. So um, now the, the, do the doors are open for us to go for top-down construction as well. I'm sure our engineers, architects will think about this and uh, get the benefit of this top-down construction in the near future. Thank you very much. I think I finished my presentation nearly within one hour, 150 minutes. Thank, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Engineer. Abisur. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank you. Uh, Ms. Engineer Nandana Surya for the uh, fruitful session conducted today on design and construction of deep basement structures. Uh, uh, may I invite uh, uh, Engineer Nandana Amunutudua, General Manager, INSI Concrete and Industrial Sales, to conduct the Q&A session. Uh, good evening, Ms. Nandana, and thank you uh, very much for uh, your presentation uh, uh, taking all your experience uh, which you gained the uh, uh, past few years with the uh, construction so we are uh, we have a uh, few questions i will uh, take the first one uh, is, uh, is it necessary to uh, provide the vehicles in order to control the water pressure during the construction foundations okay i think uh, uh, nandan i think shall i read it uh, is it necessary to provide the V-poles in order to control the water pressure during the construction? Actually, you should not keep any V-poles. When you do, uh, when you design and construct retaining walls, you keep the V-poles to reduce the water pressure. But when you do basement construction, you should not do that. Because if you do, if you provide V-poles, your groundwater table outside will go down. And that can cause a lot of damages to the adjoining buildings and you also can't do your construction because a uh, lot of water has to be pumped out also. So we never provide V-poles in the uh, temporary support systems when you do basement construction. Uh, the next one is uh, do diaphragm board uh, depend on anchors. If so, if adjacent lots uh, do not allow uh, for permanent anchors, how we can uh, use uh, such systems? Sorry, sorry, I think uh, I could not hear. Is it in the chat box or in the QA session? Uh, QA session. Yeah. Can I do? Uh, diaphragm ball uh, depends on anchors. If so, uh, if adjacent lots do not allow for permanent anchors, how we can use such systems? Do diaphragm balls depends on anchors? If so, if adjacent. Now, actually, yeah, yeah, these anchors are temporary. These ground anchors uh, will be removed once the permanent structure is done. You don't keep anchors permanently. Yeah, but I think some of the questions are asking whether if, uh, if it's uh, adjacent land is uh, uh, personal land that uh, belongs to someone else, uh, whether the <laughs> no, that is, owner that is, is right. Yeah, that is what I told you. Uh, you have to get the permission from uh, uh, outside properties. So if you don't get permission, you can't construct it. So even if you get the perm uh, permission, you have to, they will give the permission for you to do it temporarily. Once the construction is done, you have to remove the, the anchor, ground anchors. So, but this is a bit uh, 
difficult, especially in the urban areas. Because when you do ground anchoring, you have to lower the water level, which is not permitted in uh, most of the areas. That is a very good system. So next one is uh, in top-down construction, how to manage when uh, columns are not directly aligned to piles? Columns are not direct. Okay, that's a very good question. Actually, in the top-down construction, uh, you can use uh, pile caps with two piles. You know, every time we have to transfer the load to one pile. Because uh, the, the total load is transferred, should be transferred to the pile because we cannot construct the pile cap until we complete our excavation. So those are some limitations. Yeah, I think uh, there's another question which can uh, share your experience as well. Uh, that is asking, uh, is top-down construction uh, done in Sri Lanka? And I think it is better you can uh, share the uh, share your experience. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, we have not done top-down construction in Sri Lanka yet. Uh, what we use at uh, Odell is kind of a top-down because uh, we use concrete uh, frameworks on steel uh, brace. I, I showed you some uh, king post. And actually, uh, because they are we had a requirement. We wanted to uh, provide permanent, uh, like, you know, the temporary ground slab to park your vehicles. We had, to do, we had to construct the car park and work under the car park level. So we had to do the steel columns and then cast a concrete slab. Uh, then we went down to the basement, then came up. But we have not done the real top-down construction in Sri Lanka, to my knowledge. But it is not uh, rocket science, actually, we can do it. Yeah, I think uh, the project we know is somewhat close is the real knowledge. Uh, so, uh, the next uh, question is uh, please explain how. Another what is there's a, a little uh, disturbance coming. Uh, so, no, if no, you. No, 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 no please. Oh, sorry. Properly in your microphone. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, Please explain how water seepage could control uh, from the bottom of the diaphragm wall. Actually, uh, now when you take uh, the Sri Lankan context, we have our rock around 20 to 25 meter. If your excavation is about, uh, let's say, 15 or 20 meter, you still have uh, 5 meter of uh, earth. So your seepage, in, in this uh, exercise, we actually have to do a seepage analysis. So you have to do a seepage analysis and see how much of water is coming under the diaphragm wall. But our experience, because the diaphragm wall is constructed up to the hard strata, the seepage under the diaphragm wall is very almost negligible actually. So uh, you don't get see you don't get a considerable amount of seepage under the diaphragm wall. Uh, of course, if the rock the, the rock is not flat, you will have uh, some seepage, but uh, you have to estimate it. And you have, uh, pumping and dewatering has to be done uh, anyway for construction works. Please explain the waterproofing of case one uh, and methods used to uh, and the problems faced during the waterproofing. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Nandan, I can't. Uh, yeah, the question is, please explain what of uh, the what he's asking is the method. Uh, what, is it waterproofing? Waterproofing uh, during the and uh, uh, the, uh, Okay, I can see that. Please explain waterproofing of basement method use and uh, problem faced during the water. Okay, good question. Uh, now, uh, generally, when you do basement constructions, waterproofing is a very important area that you should pay your special attention. Especially uh, now, most of the basement construction in, in these scales are done on 
concrete piles. So uh, the few joints that you have to handle are the pile raft joint and also the uh, king post joint. Because king post is there until you complete your basement construction and once the uh, basement is completed only, you can remove the king post. So you have to keep a joint there. So later only you can cut the king post and close it. So that those two places, there's a big uh, chance for water leaking. So uh, the proper details, the, the proper details will help you to control the seepage. But uh, generally the water, you call water tanking, uh, you have to have a little thicker screed uh, and then the waterproofing on top of the screed where you have the critical places, as I said, near the around the piles, you have to have this layer a little thicker, so that uh, you know the 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 you can maintain uh, water level below until you do your mem waterproof membrane and concrete it. So uh, we have special details, also the good practice details that we apply for those places. Generally, it is uh, the membrane uh, waterproofing we think is better because uh, uh, we are used to two type of waterproof system, but I think uh, a tactic polypropylene membrane system is better. Uh, is that the answer? Do you need more explanation? Uh, I think uh, that is uh, sufficient. So, uh, there's another question on uh, temporary uh, concrete uh, uh, struts. Uh, how uh, feasible or practical uh, is uh, removing of concrete uh, means uh, used for uh, temporary uh, structures? Yeah, yeah. How feasible in removing concrete beams? Used, yeah, actually, uh, these concrete beams are huge. It's about uh, more than half a meter wide and it's about uh, one meter deep. And um, the removal of a con concrete was done by cutting into pieces. Uh, you have a simple uh, mechanism like you know it's electric like you know you cut timber locks with a chainsaw so that type of uh, arrangement is used to cut uh, concrete beams very carefully no noise at all uh, you cut into pieces and remove it and this uh, concrete is uh, crushed and reused for uh, construction of uh, block works and all that was Reuse. So, uh, using concrete is a, uh, also a better system. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, with regard to the, the detail of uh, what uh, you uh, Do you need to advise uh, grouting behind the diaphragm wall joints? Not necessary. Like micro piles or other piles, you don't want grout them because the diaphragm wall, the water can leak at worst scenario only at the construction joints. So construction joint is the, uh, the coming at uh, maybe four to five meter intervals and there, there you have a water bar. So if you construct properly, you don't get water leaking through the water bars. So grouting is not really required. But uh, I mean, if there is a problem, like suppose your concrete has not compacted properly, and then there's a chance of water seeping through those areas. In such cases, you have to grout and um, improve the porosity. Yeah, uh, Thank you very uh, much. Uh, Mr. Nandana, do you uh, specify any uh, special uh, type of concrete uh, with your experience with the lab or any, uh, I mean, any uh, concrete and which is suitable for uh, piling is uh, good enough for this run or any comments on the concrete? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I'm sorry, I could not hear you. I think there's some technical issue. Is it from my end or from some, your end? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, am I audible now? Little, little uh, way. Uh, can can you type it if you don't yeah. mind? Don't use your... Uh... So uh, my question is, uh, Ms. Ardana, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, quality of uh, concrete, yeah. so uh, the properties uh, which are recommended to uh, 
file could be, be suitable for diaphragm wall or any other special requirements in the diaphragm uh, wall concrete? No, diaphragm wall also actually very similar to pile construction. Uh, with the concrete, uh, we can use grade 30 or above with the same uh, water cement ratio. The minimum cement content is also same as for piling, like, you know, 390, And also, uh, it depends how you design, but uh, uh, any concrete above grade 30 is okay for diaphragm walls. And uh, that shit is fine. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Nishan, can you take over? Thank you very much, Nandana. Uh, both Nandanas, I would say. Nandana Amunutudu, Engineer Nandana Amunutudu, thank you very much, our General Manager in the Concrete and Industrial Sales. Thank you very much for conducting the Q&A session with Engineer Nandana Abe Surya. Uh, Managing Director, NCD Consultants, Private Limited, and also the President, Society of Structural Engineers, Sri Lanka. So I think today is a very interesting and a fascinating, uh, fruitful session. Uh, while thanking again Nandana, uh, may I invite Dr. Moza Balbaki, another very vital resource person uh, which we have as INSEE, Dr. Moza Balbaki, Head of Products and solution portfol uh, Solutions Portfolio. Dr. Moza, over to you to give the word of thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dishan. I would like uh, to say that uh, uh, engineer Nandana, I think 10, 10 days ago, we were already connected <laughs> to the webinar from uh, the Society of uh, Structural yes. Engineers Sri Lanka. It was really okay. great for me also to participate there. Therefore, uh, really on behalf of INSEE, on behalf of all the participants, we would like to express our really gratitude for this outstanding presentation and contribution for today's session. It was really a very, uh, I say, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, you are totally right with uh, really with uh, the two uh, big mega trends with uh, urbanization, with uh, somehow population grow, you know, the square meter of every land become very scarce and very precious. Huh? Therefore, we need to go now more deep. Huh? That is important. Even though we can see trend uh, or big multinational, they have developed even a separate business model for what they call UGC. This is underground construction business because their requirement technology are really uh, are somehow different. You need to be very innovative. And uh, for example, when you come to uh, most of, uh, when I look to North America, for example, uh, now self-compacting concrete is used almost in all these type of like underground concrete, because there you can assure full compaction. You can control temperature, you can control volumetric change and so on. That is really important for the stability of the whole, uh, uh, I say, integrity of the structure. Therefore, uh, thank you for everyone who has attended this uh, somehow knowledge sharing session. I could see that uh, we have today over 100 participants. And I hope that, uh, 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 I mean, see, Jan always repeated, even Nandana repeated the same, that hopefully next time in January, we can meet physically at our eye to eye innovation to, uh, to industry collaboration space. We hope, really, we hope that we can see you physically there, but it will be hybrid, again, hybrid. We will use still the, the I say, the, the virtual technology, of course, to reach more engineers that are really somehow in the provinces, okay. Therefore, thank you so much to everyone. And I would like also really to say uh, thank you for the whole INSEE team uh, that are really uh, somehow supporting to continuously, consecutively now 30 time we have uh, organized this uh, somehow uh, uh, knowledge sharing session uh, to the whole team. Really, I'm very grateful to, uh, to all the team, the INSEE team who, uh, who give full support. They are fully committed to continuously uh, somehow uh, uh, support to provide this kind of like uh, 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 possibility to have this every Thursday of uh, last month, you know, uh, this uh, knowledge sharing session. Therefore, uh, I would like to wish you all to stay safe. Uh, as our chairman said, the, the pandemic is not finished, but hopefully we can see the light at the end of the tunnel now. I just came back uh, this Monday from Switzerland. I was so happy to land in Colombo. I saw that everything back normal. No need for quarantine. I just came out from the airport. I can see all the taxi waiting for people. I came to my apartment. It was really great. It was I really the feeling was great. I'm very happy that 
uh, we have done at least this good, uh, somehow we went through these uh, challenges and I hope it will continuously, continuously improve to all of us. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much. I will not take more time. And again, uh, Engineer Nandana, we were really, we are really grateful to have you today. And I hope that uh, we can again see, uh, see you uh, for other seminars. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Mosa Balbaki, head of yeah. products and solution portfolio. So, uh, until we see you with the uh, meet again with the 16th webinar session, 31st knowledge sharing session organized and conducted by INCI2I, be safe. Good night. Good night. Yeah, good night. Good night.